So boxes are, are pretty interesting that uh, they give you a chance to really work on different shapes and designs and see what works together. But there are some basic tenets about a box design. There are also a fair number of basic tenets about what you have to do to turn a reasonable box, okay? But uh, let me, if I can remember the presentation, let me start with the basics. There are two large categories of boxes, although most of the boxes that you see here and most of the boxes that people make are end grain boxes, all right? But you can do a face grain box, all right? <clears throat> so you can see the grain running across it this way. What do you think might be the biggest issue about a face grain box? Yeah. End grain box, when it dries, it'll move, but it moves a little bit more um, concentrically. When you get a face grain box, it's always going to go oval. So if you're going to do something like this, you really have to do it from dead dry lumber. All right, I wouldn't do this from a, a tree. It, it was funny when that guy got a hold of me and said, I got a burl that's 12 or 15 years old. It ought to be dead dry by now. I'm thinking, nah, <laughs> not if it's 20 inches across and dry in the center. <clears throat> so that's one thing. So you can do it. You just have to be prepared that you have a really dry blank. When it comes to end grain boxes, there are really two styles, all right? Most of what you're going to see are what I would call cap fit. And that means that you have a top. You have a top that slides over a tenon in the bottom. So that's, uh, this is a pretty common design of box. Um, that's the one you get the snap fit from whenever, you, you know, people are talking about a snap fit. That's generally the way they do it. Another kind of box is where you have an insert lid. Like this. This doesn't go over the outside. This goes on the inside. And um, it's a different way of doing it. You can get a tighter fit. You can get a tight fit that way. But I think most people prefer to do it with the traditional, more traditional cap fit where you got the top that fits over the tenon and the base. <clears throat> but as an example, I'm, I'll talk about this one for a couple of reasons, a couple of other things in a minute. But this is one as well. See, it doesn't slip over anything. Nice tight fit, snap fit, but it's, it's going into this, not over it. One of the things about when you start talking about box design, I'll say that there's um, a couple of the standards. When Jason was talking last month, and he was talking about the golden mean or law of thirds, they're both close to each other. That's really on a box. You're talking about where are you going to place that break between the top and the base. This one doesn't meet that criteria that he talked about. This one's too low, all right? That typically I would put that, if you look at the either law of thirds or golden mean, I would have probably put that three-eighths of an inch higher, all right? Um, so there's, there's sometimes you can get it up Something like this, that's closer, all right? 
Um, something like this is more the rule of thirds than it is of uh, golden mean. But if you get it up too high, then the thing gets way out of balance. So on something like this, in my mind, that's just too bloody high, okay? For, and, and there are a couple of things about this one, and we'll talk about a couple other characteristics, but it just throws the look of this off to have, to have this lid too far up on the, uh, on the body. It could. It could. But you have to be really careful of a finial on a box. All right? This one has it pretty high up, right? And I put a finial on it. Does it look in proportion? It doesn't to me. It still looks like, even though I put more mass up here, it still looks to me like it's too far towards the top. Now, one of the things, uh, if you read, well, I'll talk about this in a second here too. I'll swim over to my, where my books are. Um, I'll, I'll say that the guy that started me making boxes was Richard Raffin. He's got two really great books on box design. And he, he, this one, he talks about how to do it. Here's his whole thing on the um, getting a nice fit, how you hollow it from the inside. Um, so he's got a lot of good ideas. He does a lot of talk. One of the things for him that's kind of interesting is this is this tenon is not straight. He makes it rounded so that when the top goes on, it it fits pretty easily on the very first part and then snaps down at the bottom. It comes back in again. So it it kind of really um, just snaps into place. So he's got a lot of, th these aren't all his, but he's got a lot of really interesting design issues here. Um, same with this one. And here he goes right from the beginning. This one is really a good one about design. Uh, for more than, he's doing uh, uh, for turn bowls, but a lot of the application in terms of where the weight is on a bowl and where the weight is on the box have a lot of similarities, okay? Um, but I will say one thing I learned from him uh, that was very um, fundamental was that if you're going to start making a box from a piece of wood you got off the side of the road, um, this is not a short-term process, all right? And the reason I say this is that you need to have a box that's really made out of wood that's really dry, all right? How he speeds that up is really kind of interesting because he makes, because he's a production guy, he makes boxes that a, a different set of things, but this is one of his classic, all right? Um, and what he does to make these, he will rough it out, he will begin, to uh, rough out the inside and the top, but he won't have done much to the outside. Then he'll take them and turn them like this and tape them together and throw them in a box and come back a year later. And you get enough ahead of time, you have a box full 
you can start working off the bottom of the box while you're putting in the top of the box. But by doing that, he knows he's got a pretty dry piece. There's the second thing about doing that, and this is really true if you're saying, oh, I'll make it out of branch wood that's come down in the yard, right? That when you take out this center, you release a lot of tension that's in that wood. It's going to move. Uh, not move because of temperature or moisture. It's going to move because of tension is being released. So it's, in that case, when he puts them in a box, that all that tension is gone and it's dry. So when he puts it back on, he's in pretty good shape to go. Um, so then you, uh, a cap or insert placement of the lid. Now there's one other thing you can do with the, um, when you put the, uh, the lid on and design where you're going to do the break, You've got issues if you're going to do um, figured wood or wood that has color to it, and how are you going to get that so you don't have a huge gap in here? All right. So there are a couple of things that you need to pay attention to when you do that. First of all, some of these, you know, how how tall a tenon do you really need? You know, do you you don't want to play around with it. You don't want to make a half inch space part through it with a um, with an eighth inch parting tool and take up that much real estate. You can make them short if the box is not going to be under a lot of stress. Okay, so then you automatically reduce the gap in here. Okay. That's one thing it's pretty, um, you have to be pretty careful of. The second thing is look for grain that can give you a little, or color change like this is, that can give you a little relief with that. If you have something that's swirling or coming at a acute angle and you have to take off a quarter of an inch or um, a little bit more than that, five sixteenths of an inch, you're going to see that gap. In this case, I had enough straightness in that color that I could go ahead and um, take that, that wood out for the tendon and where, I part, where I'm parting off the top and still get a pretty good match from here to here. One other thing you can do then is hide that as best you can by putting a bead in, all right? So you'll see that a number of these, um, I've gone ahead and put a bead to make it harder to see which, where is that, um, where is the lid separating uh, from the top or from the base? Yeah. So some of these, again, because these are, because these weren't dead dry, you can see they only go together one way. <laughs> All right. So, but here's another one where I've done some beating to hide where that, that joint, I mean, you can see where that joint is, but in, uh, if I had nothing in there, then you're talking about having a really tight fit like this. You can't hardly see that there's a joint there, all right? So, um, but to get that takes a little bit more effort. If I'm concerned about maybe being able to see that a little bit more, I'm going to put a bead in there to kind of hide it. In this case, I only have one bead. In this case, I have two beads. And you can guess um, <laughs> that the joint is in between. You can get carried away and you can make the beads a feature. You don't know where the joint is. 
Um, I think it's this one here, but I don't think I can get this one apart. <laughs> no. So, um, but that gets to be a little bit too distracting on a design like this. Another thing, so that's, that's the lid, the height of the lid from the, um, uh, height of the lid over the height of the base and all of that stuff. That's one thing you can play around with. Another thing you can play around with is whether the sides are straight or if you put some curvature into them. So in one like this, you got straight sides, your eye is going to go right to that joint, that, and here you have a, a, a lot of curve. I don't care for this one too much, but um, anyway, that you have curves to play with. But I will tell you that making these boxes are totally different, okay? Because here, with a straight wall, your, your wall all the way down is maybe, maybe three-eighths, maybe five-sixteenths of an inch. Where here, you can't just, you can't drill it out easily. You can drill out stuff out of here, but you're going to have to get in there with a, some kind of tool to try and keep these wall thicknesses kind of steady. Um, so you, there, you can get a lot of different variety with uh, a round, with a round shape, and it can give you a whole different aesthetic than this. But when it comes to a round one, that all has to be planned as as you rough it out, as you turn it for the first time, because. If I'm going to here, when I'm roughing it out and smoothing this together, I know exactly how far in I have to make that tenon. If I have a roundness on it, I have to make that about this thick when I do that original parting off of the top because I have to have enough real estate down here that I can taper this. So I have to maybe here, I've only gone in an eighth of an inch to the tenon. When I'm roughing this out, I'll have to go in that tenon at this joint is, is probably five eighths of an inch deep, or this one's only an eighth of an inch. You have to plan that all out ahead of time because I got to turn, I got to leave it thick enough that I can um, I can do the, the curved part. Um, one of the other things is that the question of whether you want to put something on the top. So, you know, this was an early one, very clunky finial to me. This one, pretty clunky as well. But as I got a little bit more comfortable with finials, then you can do something that's a little bit more delicate. Now, this is one of those insert tops. So this becomes a little bit a, a different design. If I was having that like one of these boxes, having that, Sticking out of there is like, no, that doesn't really work, does it? And that's because in this one, I can bring that curve right up to it so it flows as, as one movement. It goes from here down to the base and from here up and then flows up into that. So um, when you're doing um, a finial or something on the top, I tend not to put big finials on them anymore. And I'm just as likely to put a button knob on the top um, like this um, because I don't need to get it so off balance uh, by having something on the top. Um, there are some classic styles. You can see it here. This one was an early one, so I would make it different nowadays. 
This style, anybody know what this is called? What this style is called? It's called a ginger jar. All right, and so that's a pretty classic one. And that's what I was trying to do here. And uh, so that's a pretty standard one. This is uh, Richard's um, mosque kind of, of box. And then um, there are a couple other things <coughs> that, I, that you can do to these. Something like these two, these I threaded, all right? So these are hand chased. And those have to be insert lids, all right? It, it's pretty hard to do one where the, you can thread a tenon and then thread the cap as well. That's a little bit harder to do. Here you can go in and thread this and, and thread this is a little bit easier than trying to do one that fits like that. You can do it, all right, but I find it easier to do it um, when, you, when you have an insert lid going into that. Um, a couple other things I want to talk about, and then <coughs> we can maybe um, play around a little bit. And that is um, once you get a handle on how to turn a little bit, then you can start looking at, at putting some level of decoration on some of them. So something as simple as um, just putting a series of like beads on the top or this is just done with a um, sorby spiraler. Um, again, something like that. That uh, those are kind of neat. I don't like this one. That's just too much. Okay, it it's they're not perfectly even. So if you're going to do something that's a decoration on the top, you really because that's what people are going to see when they're look, if it's sitting on a table. So if they're if if it's sitting out like that, you need to have this done really well. So one of the things I do probably is, although I don't have that many here, um, one of the things I do a fair amount is do an insert. All right, and have folks done many inserts because it's, it's, it's an interesting process um, because I wind up, when I do that, you know, I cut a recess in the lid here and I'll go take a piece of uh, contrasting wood. In this case, it was just, I had some spalted wood and I'll just slap that <laughs> on a, um, uh, a chuck with a, a flat surface in it and I'll just put it on with double-sided tape. And then I'll get it a little bigger than this one. And then I'll put this back on and tweak it to shape. Once I get this one done, I'll get it just, I'll go in and keep on t tweaking this. But one of the things, again, I don't have an example here, but one of the things that I've done um, a number of times, because it's a little bit, it, it looks nice, and it uh, maybe gives you a little extra uh, relief to give that a try. When you get it like this, I'll have the lid mounted back on the, on the lathe, and what I'll do is I'll take a fine parting tool, a sixteenth of an inch parting tool, one of the little, um, I got a, one that's a blade size, about as thick as that, but it's very, it's much finer. It's only about um, five sixteenths of an inch thick. And what I'll do is I'll come in and right on that joint between the two, I'll put another little cut all the way around. And then I'll take, normally you could use resin, but normally what I use is uh, 
usually it's black um, powder tempera and uh, a little five minute epoxy and mix them together and I'll put that into here and let that set and then I'll just sand that all smooth. So now what I have is whatever the top of that box is and then there's a black, a really thin black ring that goes around the the insert to really off, you know, really set the insert and make it look, um, if you've got a, something special, a uh, special piece of wood or special thing, a cabochon of some type. I've done cabochons fairly often where I can either make a cabochon out of polymer clay. They, they look pretty nice in here. Uh, you can buy round cabochons and, um, and insert them in there. One of the things about using something like a glass cabochon or stone cabochon, you have to be aware it really adds a lot of weight to the top and it'll be kind of um, off-weighted off for me or off-center. This one, this box is a, is a totally different design. This is a, the foot is made out of one wood. The collar is made out of that same wood. This is made out of it and then this different insert. This was just a piece of same kind of stuff I'm gonna to do tonight, but I just drilled through the whole thing, all right? So it was just a hollow tube. So I turned a tenon on the bottom, stuck the hollow tube in, had a tenon on the bottom of the collar. It went into the top of that. And what that allowed me to do was do a color work on this. This is with uh, alcohol inks. You couldn't do that on a box if you're turning it like this. So it, it, it's, you'll see a wood turner's box, you want what, that when you open her up. And the reality is most people that buy a box aren't wood turners, all right? So what they're looking for is something I can reach over and, and take that lid off without having to use two hands, all right? You cannot do that with a wood turner's fit. So if you're looking to sell these, that's something to consider that you may want to make it so if your target audience is um next in this case i i think you want it you can see what i've done on this i've tapered it so it flows up and this doesn't become uh, um, counter to the the basic design um okay lid location we talked about hiding the seam easy removing grain alignment okay next please. Oh, then there was it. Cap lid slips over. Insert lid drops inside. Next. Okay, and so just these were just some different um, designs here where you can see this is kind of what we were talking about before. This is pretty poor grain match because you've got this grain running this way and then the way it is in this one, the grain's running this way. It is absolutely clear that that's where the thing is. It doesn't flow together. Whereas something like this, that's the, <laughs> that's the seam. It's pretty damn good. So you have to really work at, uh, at getting those seams if you're going to have something with dominant grain like that, really work to it. And then here, add some beads to hide it. All right, next. And then this was the roundness of, of, um, of the sides. The one key thing to remember in here is your foot size. Because if you have something that has a lot of curvature, you're, generally you're coming at the expense of a foot. When you have a, um, either a purely decorative bowl or a decorative holoform, that's one thing. 
people are not intending to use it for anything particular. You're not going to make an urn, for instance, with a really tiny foot, okay? That's going to be something substantial so it doesn't spill over. Um, the same thing is, is not true with a box because the box is meant to be opened. And so people are going to want to uh, put their hands on it. And if you have a really small foot, it'll more likely that it's going to want to uh, fall over. And so here's some round samples of round things. The classic ginger dar I talked about. Um, very small foot, tall finial. I don't think that works particularly well, okay, in, in a design. This one, this is, has an insert lid, um, nice round shape, and that's what I was saying on a number of these that I have, the finials that are inserts, you can work on that, the shape of the side to come up and help into that knob or finial that will they'll flow together. And that's a, in that case, they're trying to emphasize it, but because that's an insert lid, um, you have the shoulders coming up and hiding any seam. All right? Yep, so we talked about that. Um, this is a, a four fifths, nine fifth, five ninths, four ninths, five ninths, which is, uh, that's a little lower than it is for. Um, uh, for the golden rule or for the third two-thirds, but that's another one. Don't divide it in half. It'll look too top-heavy. Next one, please. And this is just some where you have um, a seam. So you have to be careful if you're going to put a bead in or an accenting line where you put it. If, it's, if the uh, seam is low and you put in that bead below that seam is going to look even more top heavy. So keep that in mind. If you're going to do a, a single bead and it's a little bit low, put the bead on top. Um, in this second series, the, the eggs, um, you can see that happening when the line is, when the uh, accent is below, it looks really too top heavy. So you put the um, accent line above, it looks better. But then if you put another thing at the top, it just almost becomes too much. Same with these other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Would you put the bead on there before you separate it, or you put the bead on after you separate You have to leave the real estate to form the bead when you make the tenon, all right, if you understand what I mean. So if you're, if you're going to... You have to make the decision about the bead before you part the lid off the base. And you have to leave enough real estate around where you're parting that you can come back later and add the bead if you want. All right? You can always turn it, that extra wood away if you decide not to put the bead in. But when you part it off, you better have some, uh, some wood at the top of the base and at the bottom of the lid to make that bead. And then once you put it all together and you get your, the good fit on the box, then you can come back and turn it, turn the bead. All right, next. Uh, and that's um, for addition. Um, you can do screw-on lids, lid inserts, do chatter work, texture and spiraling, add color or metal leaf. Um, I think something like this is you know, is a pretty nice box, it kind of, uh, oh, I haven't seen something like that before, that's nice, but it's got to be a pretty plain design, because now you're putting a pretty dramatic um, design on it. Something like this, where you have a collar that has a little bit of scallops in there, is small enough that when you see that, you say, oh, that's kind of cool. And it doesn't really, it fits right in with the finial lid. And um, again, it's one of those continuing the curve to come up and around to go into the, uh, to go into the lid. Um, you know, some of these are just, they're all kind of the same. They're just a small 
um, insert plug to, to go in there. Um, okay, was there any, was that it? Or was there, oh yeah, okay. So these are my favorite, my, uh, the two books on, um, on turning boxes, the, the Raffon, and Chris, uh, Raffon and, and Chris Stott ones, I think are really good. Um, this one, this is Bowles, but it's really a good one on design from Richard Raffin. So um, for those of you that don't spend as much time as I do on YouTube, there are, um, Raffin started putting a lot of his old things from his DVDs are on YouTube now. So you can watch a lot of his different things back when he was still in his um, prime. He does not do... Um, he does, he, he will do some IRDs, he may do something local, but he's not traveling anymore. We were trying to get him, um, for the AAW in 26, and he's not gonna, not gonna do that anymore. All right, oh, and then there's some videos that are pretty good. As you can see, these are old guys, uh, Ray Key, um, has been around for a while, but they all did very early. Um, DVDs um, uh, when when people were just starting to put um, wood turning on uh, on video. I think that's it, right? Yeah. Oh, so one is I have a full tutorial on our website at that link on how to turn um, a basic box, one kind of like this. All right, so it's step by step. You can go through and, and see how to do that. And then what I thought I would do today, I've got an hour and a half. So see how much I can get at this. I want you to tell me what kind of, based on all this stuff that you're seeing and the discussion that I had, what kind of box would you like? Do you want it straight sided or curved? Curved, okay. Yeah. Um, what kind of curve? Do you want something like this? Ginger box. Ginger box, okay. All right. Um, so in, in this case, if it's going to be a classic ginger, I'm not going to put beads or any of that on there, all right? And so um, is that good enough? Turn one of these? All right. Um, the other thing I want to, one other little trick I want to talk about. Yeah. Um, maybe you already went over this, but the fit of the lid, do you always do it the same way? In other words, is the lid going to uh, come over a tenon on the base? No, that's what I'm saying. The di that's the difference between what I call a cap fit. This is a cap. Okay. It fits over that. This is an insert. Okay. See, it doesn't go over. Yeah. Well, for sure. They're totally different. They're totally different. Um, the other thing, just one trick I want to tell you, and my mentor was Michael Mosho, um, really great guy out of Albuquerque. But one of the things that he did, if you're making a square-sided box, you can drill out the center with a Forstner bit, right? Problem is you got the point of the Forstner bit um, in the bottom. So yeah, you can get it out, you know, with a scraper or something, and uh, that's great. But what he taught me is make a disc out of the same wood, chatter it, spiral it, do something fancy to it, line up the grain, and then glue it in. I got one piece here, I don't remember exactly which one it is, but if you look in it. Um, oh, this one? Yeah. And you can just say to somebody, how the heck did you turn that? <laughs> so.
So that's a, just a little trick you can do because drilling out with a Forstner bit is pretty fast. Um, if you do the curved ones, and you can see that one's curved. So what I did is I drilled the f with a Forstner bit all the way down and then hollowed it to the edge of that Forstner bit um, drill mark. Okay. Mm -hmm.